I want to share with you today a message that I've entitled, Reasons to Believe the Resurrection. Reasons to Believe the Resurrection. I believe this message is going to be presented in a way that you've never heard before. It, not, that I'm, not that everything I'm going to tell you is something you've never heard before, but I think the presentation of this, you're going to see why I felt such an urgency to make sure that you got this message, and even those online today through our Easter service get this message. Today we celebrate that Jesus did something for us all. Whether we believe it or not, Jesus did something for us all, and it's called the resurrection. He died for us, but he also overcame the grave for us, and he was resurrected from the tomb. Listen, through this alone, Jesus proved without a shadow of a doubt that he was who he said he was, and he is who he says he is. Listen, the experience of Jesus' resurrection, it is vital to us all. It is also foundational for our faith. This message today is not only going to hopefully anchor and give you a more confident faith yourself, but also this, this message is something that could prove itself to be very helpful as you try to share your faith with those around you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 17 through 20. Paul talks about the significance of the resurrection. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Listen, when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can believe in that resurrection because of the proof that Jesus has provided us. If you were to look into your Bible and the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see different perspectives all sharing the same stories and observation of a risen Savior. There's so many reasons in Scripture that, that we have to trust Jesus. In fact, John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Listen, simply by believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the scriptures say you will not only be saved, but your life will be eternally changed. Listen, all throughout the gospel of, of John we, we hear a very big word that he loves to use, and that's the word believe, believe, which he points out is, is, is not only a powerful word, but he never uses it as a noun. He always uses it as a verb, which means this, your true belief of something or in someone, it will move you to action. I want you to hear me today. If you truly believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and in what Christ has done for you just simply by grace through faith in what he's done, it will change the way you think, it will change the way you live, it will change the way you look forward into the future. I want to share with you, though, seven reasons you should believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I could have added many others, but I wanted to share with you seven key reasons why you should believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first reason this. Number one, Jesus' death was a real death. Jesus' death was a very real death. Listen, you can't have a real resurrection from the grave if you don't have a real death. Listen, there's some myths out there. Um, anytime people want to prove something um, wrong um, and they don't have anything to, to substantiate that with, they try to come up with reasons to not believe certain truth. People do that with the scriptures all the time. Some people think, well, Jesus must have just fainted, and, and somebody put him in a tomb, and somehow he got out. Or he, he, got, in the, he got in the tomb, and, and, um, and, and somebody came and, and took him out. Listen, you've got to believe that Jesus died for you before you can believe that Jesus was resurrected for you. 
John chapter 19, verse 30 through 37, Jesus said, it is finished. This is him hanging on the cross. He said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear and and immediately blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you may also continue to believe. These things happen in fulfillment of the scriptures that say not one of his bones will be broken and they will look on the one they pierce. By the way, that, that, that fact and, and that uh, credibility there of that, that, that the way Jesus' legs were not broken on that cross uh, were just one of many, many fulfillments of prophecy. Not even on my list is this. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, ever died, or ever was resurrected, it was foretold that he was to come. And then it all happened just as it was prophesied. Listen, Jesus didn't just faint on the cross. Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. And Jesus' death on the cross, it paid the price for your sins and my sins and the sins of all the world. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8 says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Why do we know that that God does love us just right where we are? Because he made the first move. He made the first move. He loved us way before we ever choose to love him, even while we were still sinners. Listen, why did Jesus die on the cross? That's simple. To pay for our sins. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, Jesus had to die to satisfy the justice of God by dying on the cross for our sins. Without Jesus' death, we would still be guilty of all of our sin and we would be eternally destined for hell. But Jesus died for us all so that we could have a, a new life in Christ and that we could have eternal life in heaven. But secondly, reasons you should believe, Jesus' burial was very secure. Jesus' burial was very secure. The Bible goes into great, great detail to help us see that Jesus' burial after he died was a very secure barrier. Listen, if that, if that empty tomb was going to be a sign that Jesus indeed was resurrected from the grave, it had to be a very secure tomb so that there would be no doubt that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead. Listen, if it wasn't secure, then anyone could have said that it was a hoax. Anyone could have come up and stolen his body. But look at John 19, 40 through 42. It says, following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never used before. And so because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now listen, the book of Matthew tells us even more about this tomb and its securedness. In fact, it emphasizes how secure it is. Matthew 27, 62 through 66 says, The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while Jesus was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. 
So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. Listen, they made sure that Jesus' burial and Jesus' body could not be reached and could not be gotten out easily. There were Roman guards constantly watching the graveside, and there was a massive stone that could not just be pushed aside by anyone in order to get to Jesus' body. And by the way, you can read Matthew chapter 27, starting at the beginning, and you can read about Jesus' betrayal, his trial, his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection, all in Matthew 27. But listen, Jesus' burial, it was a very secure burial, and Matthew emphasized in that passage three different times that his burial was secure, secure, secure. But thirdly, We need to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we can because Jesus' disciples became reliable eyewitnesses. Jesus' disciples became reliable eyewitnesses. Now listen, to establish anything to be very true, you need consistent eyewitnesses. And, And it's that much better if you don't have just one, but you have multiple witnesses all telling the same story in a similar fashion. Listen, there are multiple accounts in the Bible, we can't mention them all today, where Jesus appeared to people after his death and resurrection, physically, after he had risen from the grave, proving even to them, because they wondered, hey, did did Jesus just get taken out and this is it? He proved to them, and then they shared with us that he did indeed be resurrected. First, we see that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. This was not his mother, Mary. This was one of his closest followers who loved him dearly. She was a witness of his life. She was a witness of his crucifixion, and now she's a witness of his resurrection. John chapter 20. Let's look, start and begin at verse 11. It says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, If you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. She said, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Then let's move forward in that passage. Jesus appeared to the disciples, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And then one of his disciples that weren't there on that particular occasion Thomas, he has an encounter. Verse 24 says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That is us. That is us. Listen, so Mary, she met the resurrected Savior. The the disciples, they met the resurrected Savior. Thomas, he met the resurrected Savior. And the scripture says many, many, in fact, hundreds of others 
met personally and encountered personally the resurrected Savior. Let's look at this final passage where Paul encounters what he calls his experience, but also he recalls the eyewitnesses out there. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. I pass on to you what was most important and what has also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Paul says he was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. But fourthly, you should believe in the resurrection because the witnesses of Jesus were forever changed. The witnesses of Jesus... Those who encounter Jesus in, in, in both uh, his life form but also his resurrected form, they were forever changed. Listen, none of them were the same after they encountered Jesus. Listen, if you've truly had an encounter with Jesus, you're not the same. Because the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. It changes your peace. It changes your hope. It changes your purpose. It changes your ability to overcome anything, even the grave. Listen, those that encountered Jesus, those witnesses, those followers, they became bold witnesses for him. Their despair turned to joy. Their fear turned to boldness. Their doubt turned to faith. Their shame turned to forgiveness. Everything changed in their lives. I often say this. People can deny certain facts that they think you're just spitting out, but they cannot deny a real-life testimony. That's why our testimonies are so important. They testify of what God has done, not what we've done, but what God's done in our lives. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5 says, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him and now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal. He was with the Father and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that we may have fellowship with you or you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and is with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Listen, when we share our faith with people, what we're really pointing them to is joy and hope. Because it's not a matter of a religion. God calls us through Christ to a relationship where we never walk alone anymore, where we're always having that ever-present help in our time of need, how we always have that hope that we're in the palm of his hand. Listen, John says, I want you to know about what we discovered from witnessing the resurrected Savior. I want you to have the same joy that we are experiencing in Christ. Listen, people who truly know Jesus can't help but share Jesus because they know the difference that he makes in their life and the difference he can make in others' lives. But fifthly, you should believe in the resurrection because for over 2,000 years, the power of Jesus has been shared. Over 2,000 years, the power of Jesus has been shared. Listen, think about all that has changed over the past 2,000 plus years. Yet, what are we still doing right now? We are still declaring that Jesus died for us, that Jesus loves us, that Jesus was buried in that tomb, and that Jesus resurrected from that grave the third day. We are still talking about one person, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, only one thing has remained all these years, and only one thing will remain all the rest of our life and eternity, and that is Jesus. The Scripture says He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Do you know today at least 95 different countries will recognize the death, birth, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do you know 80% of Americans will recognize Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection today on this Easter Sunday? Listen, not only is it still being shared, but Jesus' life-changing power continues to manifest itself, continues to be experienced by person after person. There are people today, maybe in this service or in some other service, they will move from death to life. They will move from hopelessness to eternal hope today just by believing in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sin and the promise of eternal life. How many of you can say that you have a testimony as well? 
that, that, hey, you can tell me, hey, I met Jesus. Here's, here's how my life was before Jesus. Here's how Christ has changed my life. Here's how Christ has changed my perspective. Here's how Christ has changed my hope. Listen, if you were to look back all throughout centuries and the past 2,000 years, you would see that Jesus always has been and has proven he always will be changing lives. But number six, Jesus proved himself through his resurrection. Jesus proved himself. He proved that he was God in the flesh through his resurrection. He proved that he was and always will be the Son of God. God himself, the Savior, he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Listen, we live in a world that wants to, to present to us that there are many, many, many ways to God. But I want you to hear me. Only Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection makes forgiveness of sin possible and salvation possible. It is the only pathway. It may sound narrow-minded, but it is gospel. It is the gospel truth. Look at John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. There won't be anybody in heaven that's there because they deserve it, or there because they earned it, or there because they're better than other people. There will only be those who have been saved by grace and who have put their faith and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus said this long before he ever died. John eleven twenty five 25 through 26. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, adheres to, trusts in, relies on me as Savior, they will live even if they die. And everyone who lives and believes in me as Savior will never die. Do you believe this? Now listen, for Jesus to save your soul and to change your life, you have a decision to make. I want you to hear me on something. Faith is not a feeling or emotion. Faith is a decision, and it is a declaration. Do you know what separates a believer from a non-believer? Faith. Faith. God's extending his grace to all of us. But one denies it. The other one receives it. One says, I don't believe that because it doesn't make sense to me. The other one says, hey, I believe in Jesus, that he died on that cross for my sins, that he was buried, that he arose the third day from that grave, and I believe that Jesus will forgive me of my sin, that he will take over my life, and he will give me what he's promised, which is eternal life in heaven. And by the way, what also separates a believer from a non-believer is, is, is heaven and hell. Listen, many people, they, they, they just don't want to believe in things. Or they say, well, hey, maybe one day I'll hold on to that. I'm telling you right now, you never know when that one day is your last day. Today could be your last day. You don't need to put off this decision because you might not have the opportunity for this decision tomorrow. Which brings me to this last point. Why should you believe in the resurrection? Number seven, believing in Jesus is the only way to eternal hope. Believing in Jesus is the only way to eternal hope. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. John 3, 16, you know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, the one that died on the cross for you, the one that arose from the grave for you, that whoever believes in him, they shall not perish but have eternal life. In fact, you can say it this way, they will not if they trust in Jesus. Now, in Romans 10, 9 through 11, it really makes the gospel clear. You say, well, hey, what do I need to believe? What do I need to claim? It's this, Romans 10, 9 through 11. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. You know what I think is so amazing about God's amazing grace? It doesn't matter if you're the thief on the cross that robbed, stole, and hurt thousands of people or killed people. My Jesus' forgiveness is for everyone he will lavish his forgiveness. If you genuinely repent of your sin, he will forgive you of your sin. It doesn't matter what your past has been. It doesn't matter what other people think about you. All that matters is that you now decide to turn your life over to the Lord and believe in his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sin. 
and for the promise of your eternal life. I wrap up with this. On the day of Pentecost, when, when Peter told thousands how our sin nailed Jesus to the cross and how Jesus also was resurrected and overcame the grave, there came this moment where the people didn't just need to hear the gospel, but they needed to know how to respond to the gospel. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 39. It says, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? What, what should we do with what we've heard that Jesus has done for us? Peter replied, verse 38, Each of you, you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Bible says the, the Spirit of God that comes to live within you, if you put your faith and trust in Him, that that is the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the grave, lives in you. you got resurrection power in you when you tap into Christ. It says, this promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Listen, Jesus is calling every one of us. We just aren't all listening. I want you to look at me right now. I want you to hear me very clearly. I, I know that I could have given you a lot fancier message. I could have said things that just maybe just made you feel better. But listen, we're talking about absolute eternal hope here. And it's worth talking about because, listen, God doesn't desire that anyone dies and goes to hell. That's why he sent Jesus. God doesn't want you to go to hell. Listen, if you go to hell knowing the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's because you chose to reject Jesus. Jesus didn't reject you. You rejected him. I'm asking you today, have you invited Jesus Christ into your heart and life? Have you declared that you believe wholeheartedly in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sin and the promise of eternal life? If you've made that decision, your life has been changed and your future is secure. But if you've not, your future is not secure. And you can't have hope beyond your circumstances, beyond your situations, beyond your age, beyond whatever it is that might come your way. But listen, for those of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ by grace through faith in him, we are forever changed. And so today we celebrate we declare that Jesus has saved us. Jesus has changed us. And we want to make sure others know how Jesus can save them and change them. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, right now, I just lift up each and every person that is, is, is a part of this right now. Lord God, I pray that they would make sure that they are sure that they have trusted you, Jesus, as their Savior and Lord. May they choose to believe, Lord, not just out of emotion, but out of devotion, that you, Lord, are the one, truly, God's only son, born of a virgin named Mary. You came to earth to die for our sins. You were nailed. You were beaten. You were crucified for our sins. Lord, your grace has been lavished out upon us. But, well, Lord, when you were buried... When you were buried and they thought that they had you completely taken care of, God, they thought that they had finally brought the end of you, Lord, you showed the world that you are the all-powerful, almighty God. Lord, as you arose from that grave and was resurrected out of that tomb on the third day after your burial, God, I pray that each and every person listening right now would choose to trust in your resurrection power and know, Lord, that your grace is there, your love is constant, and your salvation is real. All they've got to do is choose to believe in you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.